Which way are you going? And which side will you be on? Will you stand and watch while all the seeds of hate are sown? Will you stand with those who say, Let his will be done? With one hand on the Bible and one hand on the gun. One hand on the Bible and one hand on the gun. Which way are you looking? Is it hard to see? Do you say what's wrong for him is now wrong for me? Lines have changed, we've rearranged. What have we become? All the olive branches turn to spears. And the flowers turn to stone All the olive branches turn to spears And the flowers turn to stone Every day Things are changing Words once on is turned to lies People wondering can you blame them? It's too far to run, too late to hide. And now you turned your back on all the things you used to preach. And now it let him live in freedom, or well, only if he lives like me. You walk the streets of righteousness But you refuse to understand You say you love the baby But then you crucify the man I don't understand You say you love the baby But then you crucify the man you say you love the baby, but then you crucify the man. Good morning, Good Shepherd. We're so glad you joined us today. Please join me in this call to worship. Your response will be on the bottom of the screen. Welcome to worship this day. Thank you, we're glad to be here. Some have come seeking, some have come struggling. Lord, be with each one of us today. Feed our hearts and souls with your transforming love. God is truly with you all today, guiding, lifting, feeding, restoring your souls. Praise be to God who continually abides with us. Amen. We're so glad to have my family, Michael and Lisa Gunger, joining us to lead us in worship this morning. Oh, the vapor of it all It's a chasing of the wind powers of the earth so pale and thin we will set our hearts on you
Heaven taunts the hearts of men And we can feel from within The beauty of it all The mystery The swelling of a voice The rising sea The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. 
The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God who is love. And Christ who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class, gender nor sexuality, politics nor religion, personality nor nationality, count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos 
our hatred and indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. Amen. When peace like a river attended my way, when so Good morning, church. This is David Gunger. I want to welcome you to church this morning. Let's say our generosity liturgy together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May it be true of our community. Amen. I love it because right now, looks like Kate's pulling up. I'm going to go speak grace and peace to her. I hope that you speak grace and peace to your loved ones. If you're by yourself, know that you're not alone. Why don't you email someone or give them a call and say grace and peace. Grace and peace to you today.
And now a reading from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And now, having heard our Gospel text, we take a moment to open our hearts to God, to ourselves, and to each other. And whether you bring lots of faith or doubt, we simply invite you to bring your full self to this moment as you really think and feel and open to the possibility of change and healing that love makes possible in a moment like this. Just a few moments of quiet as best as you know how. As we sit here together in this quiet moment in our homes or wherever we are, we pray this simple prayer. God, open us to your love as we consider this story. Amen. Matthew's story tells us that Jesus wants to be alone here. He takes a private boat to a secluded place. Why? Well, the text tells us it was because Jesus heard what had happened. Now, what exactly had happened that sent Jesus on this contemplative retreat? What is it that became the driving incident of our story today, the feeding of the multitudes? Well, it was the death of his friend, John who was known as the baptizer. His wasn't really just a death, though. It was a murder, a political lynching. See, King Herod was torn. He was convicted by John, and yet he truly enjoyed listening to him, and therefore he protected him as much as he could. You see, Herod was married to his brother's wife. John had condemned this, and Herodias, Herod's distastefully appropriated wife, hated him because of it. The web of conflicting desire, you know, that bane of human history, it's represented powerfully in this story, and it ends in John's death. And that's become, because in the realm of scarcity, death is the inevitable result. It's against this backdrop, this realm of scarcity depicted in the political sphere, that our story today is told. It wasn't simply scarcity in the abstract. No, it was personal. Jesus' friend was killed because someone was thinking in zero-sum terms. His friend was killed because someone believed there wasn't enough room in the world for John and for John's message and narrative. Scarcity always does this. It pushes us toward a person, an idea, or a group where we attach deeply. And then it sets all who threaten said person, idea, or group as enemies that must be removed. It sees difference often as a threat. It sees stranger and enemy as someone who should be avoided and excluded when possible and exterminated when necessary. This happens naturally with human beings, from the primal story of Cain and Abel on to today. But this vision and practice of scarcity, it also gets institutionalized, and it forms these same mechanisms for dealing with competing desires, only now it calls them sacred and just because they are attached to religion or to state or to the market. And when our violent, expulsive responses to people or groups becomes institutionalized, it becomes very difficult to see. It becomes what water is to fish, you know, so pervasive that it's not even noticed. And if something can't be seen, it can't be resisted. So much of Jesus' power and danger 
rested in his inability to see and to resist this mechanism. He pointed out that it was happening. He called it unjust. He called it sin. And the gatekeepers of that mechanism hated him for it. Those who were skeptical of those institutions or had been hurt by them were drawn to Jesus naturally. And this is where our narrative picks up. The intrigued and curious crowds have followed Jesus to this remote place. They get word where he is headed, and from their own villages, they go on this journey ahead of him to meet him. Now, who was the leak? We don't know. But somebody tipped them off. And so when Jesus arrives to this remote and solitary place, it's no longer solitary. I wonder what that boat ride was like for Jesus. Mourning the loss of his friend and his colleague seeing the stakes raised for a movement that was so deeply connected to his. He must have felt the gravity of that moment on the boat. He needed to recenter, to reconnect with that rock bottom foundation of his life and vision. The same foundation that enabled him to break the backbone of fear in the wilderness where he faced those three powerful temptations, each rooted in that seductive and pragmatic promise of scarcity. I imagine he looks out across the lake feeling the breeze in his face, reconnects with his breath and with God's deep revolutionary love. He reconnects with the God of abundance. And it's clear he's done this. Just look at his response to the surprising presence of the crowd on the shore. Right? Jesus was hurting and he wanted time to gather himself and to restabilize. That's what Jesus wanted. But the crowds are in the way of his desire. Only we see him respond not with the zero-sum imagination of Herodias that becomes furious when the object of desire is threatened or denied. No, we see him looking out over the crowd and experiencing compassion. Jesus had been burned by the realm of scarcity, but he doesn't get sucked into its trap. He doesn't reproduce its pain by getting seduced into its spiral of violence, revenge, and death. Jesus is seeing and he is resisting the realm of scarcity because he has been to the mountaintop of abundance and he has seen and he has known the loving God of abundance. That's the breath he breathes, right? That's the song he hears and it's the cadence of his step. And so when he sees the crowd, he heals rather than hurts. I wonder if you can connect right now with a part of your life where the scarcity mindset has has you wanting to hurt yourself or others rather than heal. I wonder if you can identify a part of your life where you want to push someone out who's getting in the way of what you want, where you want to get rid of them because the way that you are imagining the world, there's simply not room for them or for their group or for their ideas. As the day, you know, draws to a close in our story, the disciples like the crowd, they know dinner time is approaching. They all desire a meal. But the remoteness of the place and the scarcity of the rations has them begging Jesus to dismiss the crowd. The disciples have uh, the residue of scarcity on their lips, that echo of Herodias in their words. Send them away, they say. This is the impulse of scarcity. When there doesn't seem to be enough of what you want to go around, send the competition away. When someone doesn't agree with your political or theological opinion, send them away. When a friend or a family member offends you, just send them away. We are so used to sending away our problems and the people who represent those problems. But look at what Jesus says in response, quote, they do not need to go away. Let that sit. What people, groups, or ideas exist in your life right now that you would plead with Jesus to remove and would instead hear this simple and powerful mantra of abundance, They do not need to go away. This is the theme of the parable of the wheat and the weeds, right? Let them grow together. That which the imagination of scarcity sees as incompatible, incongruous, diametrically opposed to what we want is transformed by the imagination and spirituality of abundance where they're held in tension and the posture and practice of generosity begins to seep into the situation. When confronted with deficit or lack, and when convinced that there isn't enough to go around, we often want to hoard or to protect, right? It's natural. But Jesus knows the primary way to resist the spirituality of scarcity is with the practice of giving. Jesus says to them, 
They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat, right? You give. That's the key that opens the doors of our scarce imaginations. But it's still resisted. The disciples double down. Not only is it remote, not only is it getting late, but there just isn't enough, they exclaim. But Jesus gives instructions. He puts on this climactic or theater performance of generosity and abundance. The same generosity and abundance with which he met the crowd on the shore. He tells them to shift their attention away from what they don't have, and he tells them instead to examine what they do have. Right now, in the face of that person or group or situation that you want to go away, it's so tempting to focus on what you lack and how that person or group or situation threatens the little that you already have. But what would happen if you were able to pivot, even slightly, and consider the presence of provision in your life? What do you actually have in front of you? Take note, observe, name it. That's what the disciples are forced to do in this story. And they come back with five loaves and two fishes. That's the provision. And so Jesus uses this as a theatrical moment. He asks everyone to sit down, he gathers them in small groups, and he creates basically hundreds of little tables in the wilderness. He looks up into the heavens, that symbolic place of God's abundant rain and sun, and he gives thanks for what's actually here. And then he breaks and he gives. And he gives the rations back to the disciples, and the disciples give to others, and this chain of generosity has begun a chain that inspires because it's concrete and it's imitated. And after the chain of giving ends, all have eaten to their fill. There's even more left over than what existed in that small circle of the disciples' possessions. And all they know, all of them know in their bones, this important truth of Jesus, that there's always enough if we're willing to share. This story and the bread which symbolizes life is set in stark contrast with the previous story that ended tragically with death. And we are left with the invitation. Will we see and resist the spirituality of scarcity in our lives and in our world? Will we learn to imitate the powerful example of Jesus here? Will we imitate his vision and generosity? Will we take that risky step to share when all the instincts and institutions of scarcity call us fools? Can we put ourselves in a position to be wowed by the abundance of God that Jesus shows us? And can we do this in the face of the threat of pandemic? Can we do this in the face of uh, the conflict of racial justice or with an election approaching? Can we do this in the small personal realms of our homes and our families and our churches and our neighborhoods? May God give us wisdom and vision and courage so that we may give and give extravagantly. Amen. I wonder, before we confess our faith, if you could imagine and take a moment to think of one concrete thing you'll do this week as a gesture of defiance against the vision of scarcity, as a way of saying, I am imagining this world through the lens of abundance, the abundance of God's love and of God's good gifts and of God's way, which shares and loves. Take a moment just to imagine what is that thing that God may be leading you to do this week. God of love, as we pay attention right now to the things that are coming to our minds and our hearts when we think about generosity and when we think about abundance, as we consider those parts of our lives where we're tempted to scarcity, would you make this concrete? Would you give it legs this week? Would you help us to share with trusted friends so that we can spur each other on toward love and good works? And would you guide us powerfully with courage and resolve as we resist the forces of scarcity in this world and in our hearts. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, having reflected on our text, we take a moment to declare our faith. This week, we declare the Apostles' Creed. This is one of the oldest and most essential forms of the Jesus story that we have. It was handed on to us, and we'll hand it on to generations after us. There are some of you who struggle with parts or uh, maybe large portions of this creed, and that's okay. What we do when we say this creed is that we do this together. 
We are on a journey toward God and we're doing it through the Jesus lens and we're doing it connected to the tradition that we've received. And so with the freedom of faith and love, let's declare our faith. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now having declared our faith, we take a moment to offer our prayers. Uh, these are prayers written by our people for not only our people, but for the world. And so this isn't a passive moment, but take your faith, your open heart, join it to these prayers, and let's open our hearts to God together. Heavenly Father, the pandemic, systemic inequalities as related to race, sexuality, and income, and the political strife running through the core of our country has us in a state of great anguish. We ask that you help us put aside our differences and gather around the principle that under your name, we were all created equal, and that as a single unified people, we've been called to form a more perfect union that leaves no one out. I ask that you remind us, citizens and elected leaders alike, that despite the distractions of political divisiveness that have muddied the waters of our collective consciousness, that not one of us has the authority to do harm or oppress anyone else, and at the same time, embolden those of us living on the margins, and let them never forget that their life is no less significant than anyone else's. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we ask that you encourage us as the church, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, of the value that Christ laid out for us that reside at the heart of our faith. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who thirst for justice. Blessed are those who show mercy. Heavenly Father, remind us all how to make peace and to love one another as your children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, bless the peoples of the earth. Help us see past our national identities and see the child of God in each one of us, no matter their religion, nationality, sexuality, or economic status. Help us steward the great blessing that is life on our planet. Please help us take care of it and each other and never allow us to fall into the trap of believing any of us might not be worthy of love. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And now having offered our prayers, we take a moment for confession. Confession is that courageous place where we honestly and rigorously evaluate our own lives, where we enter into that act of holy memory and we take responsibility for the ways that we are falling short of love. It's this rhythm, it's this practice that connects us to the Jesus story and to Jesus way of not only offering forgiveness, but receiving it as well not only pointing out what's wrong and what needs to be healed, but also looking within and seeing what needs to be shifted and altered in here. What within my heart needs healing? That's what this moment's about. And so in the context of God's kindness and love and mercy and generosity, you know, through the lens of abundance, let's enter into this practice of confession. Just a quiet moment for you to reflect on the week behind you and ask God to point out or bring to the surface that which is important. God, as we remember the week behind us, we pray you'd give us extraordinary patience with ourselves, that you would open the aperture of our hearts to let the light of your love and your grace and your patience in and that we would be able to see honestly and soberly what we've done and what we've left undone. And we remember that we're not alone, that we're together in the ways that we fail. And so together we pray and we confess. 
Would you join me in this confession, this corporate confession? Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that you would delight, we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now friends, hear the good news of Jesus Christ and let it wash over you the way that we're told in the Bible that God's mercies are new every morning and the way that the sun shines and the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Hear these words. The Lord is merciful and gracious. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward you. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. You are loved and you are welcomed and you are embraced in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, friends, having confessed our sins, we take a moment to offer thanks to God and to come to this table, which represents that vision of abundance, that bread which is blessed and broken and given, not only in the person of Jesus Christ, but through the work of those who bear Jesus' name and those who imitate Jesus' example. Would you come to this table with a sense of gratitude as we pray this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is beautiful and good to say thank you. And so right now, scattered across the city, uh, many of us across the country and even some around the world, we all lift our hearts to you right now. We say thank you for the good gifts of our lives. Bring them into focus, sharp focus right now, so that we, like the disciples, can see what is in front of us, what you have provided, what you have given. And may we be inspired right now, not only through the good gifts of our life, but also as we consider the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of his life, of the stories that we have of him, and of the witness, not only that he left behind, but his disciples and every generation up to now so that we struggle to bear witness to the same love which we see there. We pray right now that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your word, that these gifts of bread and cup would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night he was betrayed took bread and cup and blessed them. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so right now we welcome you risen Christ. We thank you for your presence with us always and forever. May we who call you Lord embody your generosity. May we learn to increasingly take on your vision of abundance. And may we resist the current of scarcity. Amen. And likewise, Jesus took the cup. And after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So we welcome you and remember you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this cup which tells of a new covenant, which is to say it's a new arrangement for human beings and human relationships where we no longer attach and create bonds of reciprocity and solidarity through kinship or through identity or nation. We instead do it because we are all connected by your love as the new humanity. And so may we ourselves take of this cup and begin to see the world in that way and act accordingly. Amen. And now we declare the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
And now, friends, wherever you are, whether you're at home or you're in the park with some friends right now, social distancing, we invite you to take this meal um, as an act of faith and an open heart. Uh, we, our practice is in tinction, where you take the bread and you dip it in the cup, and you simply say, thanks be to God. And if you're wondering if this practice is for you, uh, we simply invite you to consider whether you're drawn to the love you see in Christ. And if so, let this act be an open heart of response, of solidarity, your gesture that you love and trust the love you see in the life of Christ. Let this meal be for you. Amen. Thanks be to God. Now, friends, we'd like to invite you um, to consider a few opportunities that are on the horizon. Uh, one of them is connecting with one of our small groups. We have groups right now that connect around a sermon discussion and they reconnect on like what's happening in the week and uh, have a chance to pray for each other. So if you've been a Good Shepherd parishioner or you live in New York, those groups are for you. We even have a book study that's going on um, that you may be able to jump into uh, on uh, Richard Rohr's book, uh, The Universal Christ. Uh, I know it's been stirring good conversation. I'll be dropping in next week on that to sort of talk with uh, those who've been tracking with the book. Uh, and we'll continue to have opportunities for you to connect uh, in the weeks to come. We do want you to know that we'll no longer be doing the eights starting this week. Um, we started doing the eights as a daily sort of touch base point um, at 8 a.m., 8 p.m. Uh, when things were crazy and we didn't know uh, what was on the horizon or what life would look like and things were changing so drastically every day and we just needed a contact point because we were all isolated. And then gradually we moved it to once a day and then we moved it to uh, every other day and then now it's, it's Tuesdays and Thursdays and uh, we've had a sense that it's run its course. Uh, so if you're a regular on the eights, uh, we encourage you, we'll connect you with other regulars and you can form perhaps your own meeting and group, but we just wanted you to be aware that we're going to formally uh, stop facilitating uh, what we've been calling the eights. Finally, I mentioned last week that there's a chance to serve one of our partners in the South Bronx, a house on Beekman. They're moving their headquarters. And one of the ways that you can help is on Saturday, August 15th, you can help move uh, by showing up and using your manpower or woman power or child power, whatever power you bring, use it to help that, that uh, move for our dear partners in the South Bronx. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in, you can email jeremy at goodshepherdnewyork.com and he will uh, be putting a list of volunteers together and we'll get the specifics about times and length of commitment and such. Uh, but please set that date aside and make plans uh, to be there if it's possible. Uh, we'll be sure that it's safe and clean and sanitary and that all the, the safe uh, protocols that we've been following in this third wave in New York are followed and observed. But this will be a real way, uh, not only that you can show some generosity, uh, but that you can do it relationally and with your presence, not just uh, writing a check, which is important. Uh, and we do that. But these moments really matter as well. So if you're in the city and can help, we'd love to see you. I'll be there myself. Um, and now, having heard these things, we invite you to receive our benediction. And now friends, receive this benediction. Go in peace, go in love, go in the company of the Lord who is near to you. Do not leave him in this place, but walk forward into this day with him, the one who walks before you and behind you and with you, his hand ever resting on you, his words ever whispering to you, his love ever reaching for you. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Amen.
Go in peace. Sometimes in 